Let's bring in the president of the West Virginia Education Association, as it is known now, Dale Lee. Dale, good morning to you. Good morning. How are you? I am great. How are you? Have you been to any of your high school class reunions, Dale? Uh, actually, I went to Baileysville High School, and when they closed the school and consolidated and made it west side with Oceana and Baileysville, we had an all-class reunion. That was about uh, 2001, somewhere around there. And uh, I went back to that. My dad was a teacher, and, and a couple of my brothers went. Um, I graduated high school. I was five foot seven, weighed 120 pounds. I'm now six two, and quite a bit more than 120. <laughs> uh, I was standing in line. We were standing in line with my dad and brothers to to eat, uh, get something to eat, and my algebra teacher algebra two teacher was talking to my dad and my brother and, and just kept talking and never recognized never said anything to me and then she finally said well whatever happened to dale where's he at now i'm standing right beside him <laughs> she said oh no you were a little bitty guy <laughs> well, a, a late bloomer a late bloomer I, I noticed that you were eager to tell us your height but not the weight though dale that that's exactly right there's some things that you just don't tell I understand. Well, uh, between the three of us here in this uh, studio, we had three different high school experiences. John's was at a uh, private Catholic school. Mr. Gilstrap was bussed into a public school back uh, during the late 60s, uh, a very tumultuous time, and had a, a rough experience in high school, so to speak. Uh, I went to Catholic grade school and then public high school, so I kind of went in and out of, uh, of those two different worlds of, uh, of a private Catholic school and then a, a public uh, high school. I was I was the opposite. I went to public school until middle school, and then I went to private school after that. Mm -hmm. And yeah. to be clear, the busing experience was for junior high, seventh and eighth grade. Junior high, gotcha. Right. All right, very good. Uh, Dale, as we start a new school year, what is the state of West Virginia public schools in regards to employment and staffing at this time? Well, I, I just read an article on Metro News where uh, Superintendent Sachs over in Berkeley County said that they have – 180 positions that are filled with permanent subs right now and there's several other positions that haven't been filled uh so it's you're seeing the same thing this year that you saw last year uh shortage of of certified teachers now uh, you will i would hope that that number from 1705 of last year drops a little bit but i'm not terribly optimistic that it's going to drop too much uh, I did, however, speak yesterday at Concord University to uh, student teachers, and I was expecting maybe about 20 student teachers, and I was pleased to find there were about 50 of them. Uh, so, so more students are, are going into our, our education system from Concord, which is a good thing. But another statistic I read that in 1975, 22% of college graduates were in education, and now that has gone dropped to just 5%. So people are just not going into education as a career. When was the 22%? Uh, 75, 1975. Wow. A great year, by the way. Great year. Carl, Carlton Fisk, that home run in, the, yeah, in Game 6. I'll be celebrating six. my 50th high school reunion uh, in, in uh, 2025, so... Cool. Hope you, I hope you attend. I hope we have one. Uh, actually, I hope we do. The um, what? What would you say? The uh, you were saying in one county that there there are 100 180 permanent subs. What percentage do you think, just just roughly statewide, of teaching positions are covered by people who are permanent subs who are not uh, certified teachers? Well, last year there were uh, 1,705 positions that didn't have the certified teacher in it now uh there may have been a retired person in that it was certified in that area but that was about nine percent of the teaching positions across the state of west virginia uh so it, it's you have to be careful when you say that because it may be someone that, who's a certified teacher just not certified in that discipline area that is working on a, a permit in that area or a retired teacher who was certified in that area that uh, is just retired and, and looking at it as a substitute position. 
Do they do a lot of recruiting at colleges? I mean, I, I saw you were at Concord, which is a, a good school for teachers. I mean, are we really pushing pushing this and and trying to talk to you? Do you do do um, does the education industry? I mean, do you guys go to a lot of college fairs? Kids graduate and say, "Hey, you know, you're you're still looking around for a career. Why don't you Why don't you try teaching? Do you guys Do you guys do a lot of recruiting? Well, one one of the things that we've done well in West Virginia is we have the Underwood Smith Scholarship Program, and uh, that there's 25 students each year, 25 roughly, maybe 26, 27, depending on funding, that uh, make a commitment to go into education, generally in a in a uh, shortage area like math or science or or special ed or something like that. Uh, and they get, oh, uh, a, a large scholarship to do that each year as long as they maintain their grades. Uh, this We have the first – this has been going on for five years. This year we have the first group that graduate uh, that are going into the system. But the commitment is you have to stay in West Virginia at least five years for, for that to uh, uphold. If you don't, if you leave, then you have to pay back the scholarship fund. So that's helped in recruiting. <clears throat> I mean, that. Uh, we, sorry, sir. There, there are also a couple other things. We're in a, a type of situation where you grow your own, where we're giving high school students some some college credits and college classes uh, to kind of help them into education and go into teaching. I mean, that the scholarship you're talking about. I mean, that that sounds neat, but that's mm -hmm. um. I mean, that's really just fluff. Because it's not it, even it it's not even it's not even a drop in the bucket. If you have seventeen hundred plus, you're giving out twenty five scholarships. I mean that that I mean it, it looks good, but what sort of actual recruiting? I mean industries are out there, corporate recruiters are out there constantly. Is there a lot of recruiting done to talk about the the virtues of teaching, the positives of it? I mean, is that really? I mean, does anybody get out and espouse that in the uh, in the, the colleges? Yes, we do all the time. But one of the difficulties that we have in West Virginia, even though for the last five years, we, teachers have, educators have received a pay raise, we still drop the 50th in the nation in pay. And you know yourself over there in the Eastern Panhandle that you can drive 30 minutes and make anywhere from 10 to to twenty thousand dollars more. So we're recruiting teachers in the classrooms in West Virginia. They're getting some experience. And then they're moving across the border because of the pay. Uh, you're right. The, the the scholarships are just a drop in the bucket. One of the things that we could do is to increase the funding for that. Uh, but that takes legislative action. It takes legislative actions to get our pay competitive to our contiguous states. Uh, you know, those those are the difficulties that we face in West Virginia. Well, I said during our first segment that I think teachers, I, I think we need to look at it as a business. I'm a business mm -hmm. owner. I think when you're in an industry and you're not attracting people because your salaries are low, then all of a sudden you have to jump your salaries like crazy, not just, you know, 1%, 2%. I mean, look at, just take sheets. They were paying 10 bucks an hour a few years ago. They're paying $18, $19 an hour because if not, they don't have the workers. And in the teaching profession, we don't have the workers. So, I mean, when we had the workers and teachers were saying we're underpaid, it's like, okay, great, you're underpaid, but there are enough of you. Now the market, what the market will bear is the market is not working. The teachers need to be paid a lot more. We need to tighten our belts as a state, I believe, and give the teachers a lot more pay so that we can get teachers because it's the most important thing we can do is educate our kids. And when are you going to run for the legislature? That would be a great platform. <laughs> well, my, uh, my, my legislator is phenomenal. He's Mike Hornby. And yes, he, he believes teachers should make more money, and he's and he's one of the strongest proponents of education that I know, and he's he's a good Actually, friend of mine. Uh, uh, Delegate Hornby and I are working on a couple of things that that will uh, uh, help with this teacher shortage. Uh, so he is very good, but but again, we need more people with a voice saying that. Uh, we need more people to in Charleston to to recognize that this shortage is a crisis. It's a crisis for our students. Uh, but yet we want to send more money out of public education into the HOPE scholarship and, and, and those types of things to take it out of public education. 
John Gilstrap. Morning, Dale. I want to go back to something you said a couple minutes ago. Make sure I understand. Um, hypothetically, if if I'm a certified English teacher, mm-hmm. and I am in fact teaching a math class, how mm-hmm. am I listed? Am I listed as an uncertified teacher in in the ranks because I'm teaching math instead of English? Is that yes. what you said? Yes, you are, you are on a permit in that subject area, so. Uh, that would be in part of that 1,705. And that's why I don't say there's 1,705 vacancies last year. There weren't vacancies. There there was someone in the classroom. It just been, might have been someone with an out-of-field authorization or someone on a permit that's working toward that or uh, a retired teacher that may have been certified in that subject area that's there. But all those count in that 1,705. So that's really only applicable to the upper grades, right? Not for the lower no, grades? No, it's, it's not. We have uh, 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 elementary positions, first grade, second grade, third grade positions that uh, I, I know places where first grade class had uh, five or six different substitute teachers during the year, that, that this is all across the, the curriculum. It used to be that it was mainly in, in math and science, uh, and special ed, but now it's all across the, the curriculum area. So if, if you're not certified in elementary education, Dale, and you're subbing at an elementary school, but maybe you taught in high school, does that count as an uncertified teacher? Yes. Oh, interesting. Yes, it does. So, okay. So these aren't necessarily unqualified teachers or teachers without right. experience. They are teachers who just aren't specific in that discipline. This is news to me. I didn't realize that. This is right. actually, it's less, it feels less dire. Yes. Than, than I thought it was. Um, well, it's still dire. I mean, uh, you know, you, you really have to know the the, the subject matter that you're teaching and, and the pedagogy and, and the ways to reach the children at that level. Um, I'm, myself, I'm certified K through 12 in, in uh, special education, uh, but I'm a much better high school teacher than I was an elementary teacher. I taught elementary six years and, and wasn't very good at it. Uh, I'm a much better high school teacher, so it's it's being in the right place and being with that subject area. It would be it would be difficult to take someone um, that has, let's say, a uh, English certification and have them teach physics and chemistry. That's that's the difficulty that we see. Yeah, and we didn't mean to discount that, of course. However, right. uh, at least we have someone who has a degree in yeah. education in that classroom and not me walking in, in, in there in, in, trying in to teach calculus. There, <laughs> in many cases, there are examples where people uh, who just have a, a college degree uh, start a certification process, a permit process, where they're taking the pedagogy classes uh, as they're teaching. So there are examples of that, too, and and I don't have those numbers. I'll, I'll just try to get them for the next time that I come on. So we, over the last few months, or the last few months of the last school year, a lot of attention was brought to test scores, certainly around in, in mm-hmm. the Eastern Panhandle. And the, the stepchild of the test scores are the discipline problems. And it seems to me that they're closely sure. related, right? So you've, you've sure. got the test scores are tied to academics. And attendance. And attendance. And attendance problem. So... If you've got test scores are tied to academics and then you have the discipline that's that's tied to acting out and I would argue boredom right if you're not attacked if if you're not keeping the kids attentions and attention then they're gonna be acting out so you can only attack so many things at one time so which side of that equation should we be focusing on is it the academic side or is it the discipline side well we're actually hitting it uh, the academic side already with the the K tw- K through three reading and, and math program that we've started uh, this year you will see aids classroom aids in the second grade and next year they'll be put in the third grade to give another set of eyes to help those kids and what you're seeing from that is is you you're seeing an, an increase in our test scores in the very early grades uh, one of the things that I would argue with for the high school test scores, for example, is we use the SAT for our assessment program for that. Uh, you you all remember back in the day when you were taking tests, getting ready for college, 
you either took the ACT or the SAT. You took the SAT if you were going to apply out of state, generally, and back in my day. That tells you how old I am. Um, but we use that as an assessment tool for all of our 11th grade students. Now, maybe about 53% of our students are, are going to college. So tell me how someone that's, that's majoring in or, or that's looking into uh, auto mechanics or uh, electrician or, or different subject areas there, how are they going to take a test that's geared toward college entrance especially the higher math and, and, the, and the higher science, and how is that fair to them? You should be looking at a, a multitude of, of assessment areas for that. And for our technical career and technical center kids, many of them, uh, I, I think we have a large percent that pass the certification exams that they get and become certified and, and employable immediately after graduation. So, So we're doing better than what, just a single test score will show, uh, you, you have to have the fairness of that. And the SAT is, I think, particularly unfair in that circumstance. Mm -hmm. I, I, again, I'm learning today uh, because a lot of the SAT is a test-taking skill. There is a strategy sure, sure to how to approach sure. the SAT. It's not just knowledge. It's literally, there's, there's a, a, a skill. I remember this because when my son was taking the SAT many years ago, um, he, he took it one time and uh, did, did not do so well. And we sent him to a, I forget what the course is. And it wasn't the lack of knowledge. It's the approach to the right. test to understand how it's being done. And the scores went up amazingly. So sure. without that kind of preparation, especially in the circumstance you're talking about, that's deeply unfair. Sure it is. Sure it is. And, and in many cases, uh, our, our special needs students are taking that test. The learning disability uh, students are, t are taking that test. So that's really unfair when you're taking a test where you may be reading on a uh, eighth or ninth grade level and you're taking a test that's based on an 11th grade level read. That's really unfair to you. Let me, let me get back to the uh, teacher pay issue. Has anyone okay. ever thought about, I mean, one of the, I mean, one of the great things about what teachers do get, and they are underpaid, but once they've got the 30 years and certain age, they get a pension forever, which most of us do not. I mean, the state is paying, is paying them for the rest of their lives. So it does make up for some of the disparity in their pay during their career where most people don't get that. Has anybody ever suggested an alternative pay method where teachers could select to be in a program where they get a lot more salary and have a lot lower pension? At the end, I mean, is that is that a could or, that be or, an option? Or go it for a TSP account of some sort, four hundred one k, four hundred three b, or forego it to have you know to make fifteen thousand, twenty thousand dollars a year more, but have to invest for their for their retirement. I mean, Dale, it, I think that would help. Well, I will push back a little bit on that. That most people don't have a retirement plan. Uh, most of the working people that I know do have a retirement plan. It may not be a defined benefit plan like like we have in, in education but you'll have a 401k or something like a do, defined contribution well, and, plan and, and that's exactly what i was saying something, something where they would have yeah. to con where they would yeah, make I, a lot and, more salary and contribute for themselves well, yeah we we at west virginia in the early 90s uh switched over to a defined contribution plan like you're talking about and uh what you saw is the variance in the stock market and uh, you may have $300,000 in your account this year and the stock market crashes, and then you, you drop down to $75,000 and, and you can't afford to retire. A defined contribution plan. West Virginia is actually one of the few states that switched back from a defined benefit, I mean, a defined contribution plan to a defined benefit plan because it ensures that you have uh, a retirement system that, that's going to be healthy. What you're finding is many young teachers who are not going to look at education as a career uh, would probably want to do something like that, but then you're not solving the problem there. You're not getting them. You're not. You're just creating a revolving door in in education uh, and not getting people that that want to make this a career. Well, I mean, ninety percent of Americans probably are in something where they don't have a pension, and they all do fine, and they 
I mean, they invest. Uh, they de- I mean, they don't all do fine, but they all invest, and they understand that's how it is. I mean, if teachers had a choice to have a much larger salary in exchange for not having a pension, I mean, I, I think giving them choice and not treating them like lemmings might uh, – I mean, it could help. I don't. I don't know, but I mean, I know I would rather have the money and have control over my retirement than have a much lower salary and say, "Hey, you know, down the road I'll get a pension." What if you get hit by a bus when you're 50? The pension's gone. Whereas if you still have that money, it can be passed along to your to your heirs if you've invested it. Well, if you get hit by a bus, the pension is not gone. It goes to your your. Uh... Uh, your beneficiary so depends on how when you retire it depends on which option you select yeah yeah you, when you retire yes when you retire but but most people don't now they can't retire until they're 62 so if you get hit by a bus at, at 50 your your uh, 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 beneficiary is going to receive your pension how about we just designate two percent of each year's surplus to teacher salary uh, that Love would that. be absolutely wonderful Dale Lee is our guest here, president of the WBEA. Dale, how is the merger uh, structure going right now? When is your uh, target date for becoming one with the uh, AFT? We are still shooting for uh, September of 2025 to have the new organization in place. Uh, We are looking at the end of March of this coming year to have both organizations vote. On, on accepting the new organization, the merger. So things are, are going in process. There's still a lot of work to be done, but but we're on on course to, to have a new organization by 2025. What are you going to do with all that free time, Dale? Well, I have a four-year-old grandson and a seven-month-year-old grandson, and, and I had the opportunity since I was speaking at Concord yesterday at 11, I, I got to take my little four-year-old grandson. He loves Halloween, and uh, now that Lowe's has all their <laughs> their Halloween things they up, do. Uh, I got to take him to Lowe's and, and McDonald's for breakfast in the playground. So I imagine I'll be spending a lot of time at Lowe's and McDonald's. That's going to be better <laughs> than talking to me. I don't blame you, man. Well, you know, I, I enjoy talking to you all, but uh, being with those two little boys is, is really the highlight of my life. Hey, Dale, thanks so much. Appreciate your time this morning. Thank you, guys. Have a great school year.